Thank you very much, sir. I wish to put on record my sincere thanks on behalf of all the organizers to our most esteemed dignitaries of this inaugural session. Professor Glenn T. Martin, President, WCPA, World Constitution Parliament Association, Professor Redford University, USA. Your enlightening inaugural address will certainly pave way for more fruitful deliberations and outcomes from this six days international webinar. My words would not suffice to thank our Honorable Vice Chancellor Sir, Professor Rakshpa Singh Sir, whose wholehearted support in conduct of this webinar proved to be the great driving force in materializing the things as we had planned while dwelling upon this international seminar on behalf of all the organizers. Sir, please accept our heartfelt thanks for your motivation, encouragement and support. Professor P.K. Dashora, former Vice Chancellor, Kota Agricultural University, MPAT Udaipur and University of Kota has always been a pillar of strength for all our endeavors. My gen his genuine scholarly inputs have deep meaning in policy formulation and guidance in critical inputs. I thank you once again, sir, for joining us as chief guest and enthralling us with your words of wisdom. Thank you all for your participation and all the participants from around the globe. We are overwhelmed by response and look forward to having you all with us in this week long international webinar. Now we move to the next session in which we have keynote address on leadership for global peace by our luminary speaker, Professor Glenn T. Martin. And I also welcome Professor P. N. Murthy, who would be the session coordinator for this lecture session. I'm sharing a brief about Professor P. N. Murthy with you all before I hand over the session to Professor Murthy for conduct of this session. Professor P. N. Murthy, the Vice President, Earth Constitution Institute, USA, presently a cost and management accountant in practice, charter insurer, UK, and accredited management teacher, AMT is also working on insurance education and skill development in India. Professor Murthy is associated with different organizations in different capacities as CEO, Kaushal Vikas Foundation, a school for skill development, project head, Hendrik Darts India Private Limited, member governing council, SFGC Bangalore, director studies, National School of Insurance Education and Research, NASIER India, and member Shesha Pipuram Research Foundation, Bangalore. Professor Murthy has a vast experience in management in LIC and other insurance organizations. He has academic knowledge, shares assignments as visiting faculty, and is also a visiting faculty in Sheshadripuram First Grade College, Bangalore, Insurance Institute, Guiding Research Scholars, etc. His recent writings are Emerging India Insurance Sector, Opportunities and Challenges, and Role of CMA in Life Insurance Organization. Professor Murthy has received Global Peace Award. Vishwa Chetna and other awards for his contribution. Welcome you, Professor Murthy. And now I hand over this session for the keynote address by Professor Glenty Martin to you. Over to you, Professor P. N. Murthy, sir. Thank you, Dr. Tyagi. I have the greatest honor of uh, introducing Dr. Glenty Martin, the keynote speaker of this session. Amongst his many uh, credits in his profile, I would be sharing uh, only a salient few. He is currently the professor of philosophy in Radford University, USA, since 1997. He is the president of World Constitution and Parliament Association. He is the executive director, Earth Constitution Institute. 
President, International Philosophers for Peace and Elimination of Nuclear and Other Threats to Global Existence. And he is also the ex officio president of WCPA India. He also held a few previous positions uh, which are notable. Member International Advisory Board of Radio for Peace International Costa Rica. Member World Coordinating Council Global Ratification and Electoral Elections Network GREN. Chair Steering Committee of the New River Bokai Project Nicaragua. A brief about his educational background. He has BA philosophy as major from State University of New York at Buffalo in 1970, MA philosophy from Hunter College of Saint City University of New York in 1976, and a PhD philosophy from the Graduate Center of the City University of New York in 1985. His areas of specialization are philosophy of religion, peace studies and its relation to global issues. And areas of competence are history of Western philosophy, ancient, medieval and modern, special foci, the history of metaphysics and history of ethics. Interestingly, his PhD dissertation is on the transformation of nihilism, a study of metaphysical truth in Nietzsche and Wittgenstein. Lectures and panels. He has participated in the Constitution for Federation of Earth 2002, History of US-Cuban Relationships 2001, World Peace and Democratic World Government 1999, Global Environment in 21st Century in 1998. He has pro presented innumerable prof professional papers, salient are Unity and Diversity in the Constitution for Federation of Earth 2001, Marxist Dialectical Phenomenology and Constitution for the Federation of Earth 2001, Global Crisis and the Need for the World Government in 2001, Humanity at the Crossroads between Self-Destruction and Liberation, Role of Religion in the Revolutionary Praxis 1998. He has innumerable publications to his credit. Most important of them are Millennium, Millennium Dawn, The Philosophy of Planetary Crisis and Human Liberation, Democratic World Government and Thought of Mahatma Gandhi. And in 2013, he was conferred on upon GUSIP Prize International in Manila, Philippines, in November 2013. So this is the interesting profile of uh, Dr. Glenn T. Martin and uh, we see that his profile and thoughts are more relevant in this current context. So thank you so much for giving me an opportunity to introduce Dr. Glenn T. Martin and now over to Dr. Glenn T. Martin for his keynote address. Thank you, Dr. Glenn T. Martin. Thank you so much, Professor Murthy, for that uh, very wonderful introduction. Uh, it was uh, much more than it was necessary to uh, to just uh, initiate this talk, but uh, I very much appreciate it. Um, uh, could, uh, is the slide uh, show up? Uh, now, could could we have the first slide, the, the next slide, please? Or am I controlling this? Should I should I control it or how does this work? So it, we'll do it. We'll manage it. OK, so yeah. can we look at the first slide? The next slide. Yeah, that's it. That's it. Thank you. Um, that one, yes. Uh, so, so I, I want to uh, try to frame the concept of peace leadership and education uh, in in as broad a uh, context as possible. 
Uh, I, I would like to uh, uh, argue and, and uh, elaborate the idea that uh, that peace is an integral concept for human beings. And it, it, there's at least three components that uh, are we need to consider if we're looking at peace, leadership, and education. Uh, and they're listed here on this slide. The, the subjective component, that is human consciousness, the cultural component, uh, the various cultures of peace and violence around the world, and the institution or structural component. Uh, as some of you may know, there's a well-known uh, spiritual thinker named Ken Wilber, who has put out uh, something called All Quadrants, a, 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 uh, a diagram of uh, a complete uh, lo look at our human situation. And he has a fourth component in his. He's got these three components. And then his fourth component is scientific development. Uh, and of course, that that will be uh, important. Uh, but uh, I want to emphasize that these three, the subjective, the cultural, and the institutional, are, are most foundational if we're going to really uh, promote a peace uh, transformation of our world system. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, one of the things that uh, people say is that peace is a an ideal, but in many people uh, identify themselves as realist and they say, well, I'm a realist and look at the world is just not a peaceful place. And uh, if you're going to be a realist, you have to realize that it's a dog eat dog world and so on. Uh, but but this this does not understand, I think, this perspective of so-called realists does not understand that human beings uh, 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 are are self-transcending creatures. Our consciousness, precisely because it can understand that there is that that the world is a dog-eat-dog -dog place, or the world is a place of conflict and violence and uh, and lack of peace. Precisely because we can recognize that means that we have within us a concept of peace, right? We would not be scandalized, as the slide says, by what is not peace if we did not have an intuitive understanding of what is and should be peace. Uh, and uh, so, so there's there's within human consciousness. This is what I refer to as the self-transcending aspect of human con consciousness. The fact that we, each of us, is a subjectivity, conscious of the world as a, our object and other people as the object of our subjectivity, already is, is a moment of self-transcendence. And as soon as we cognize that world and understand it, as soon as we make judgments about that world, we can see that our judgments about what is not right. You know, I say this is this is not right. This shouldn't be or this is good. This should be and so on. As soon as we make these judgments, we're 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 implying that we already have a concept of peace within us. Uh, uh, the, the difference between what is not right and what is right on all levels uh, uh, shows that our consciousness is is something that transcends the world as we find it. If we find the world, uh, realistically speaking, as a place of uh, conflict and violence and so on, we're already in our in our consciousness. We've transcended that. Uh, next slide, please. So I, I want to. Uh, uh, emphasize that peace is, as it says here, is a complex and integrated concept. We, it, it applies on, on many levels. I say I want peace within my family. I want peace with my wife. I want peace with my brothers and sisters. I want peace with my community. I want peace uh, between nations. I want uh, uh, and I want inner peace and so on. Uh, all these uses of the world peace 
uh, show that it, it, it is an integral concept. And it, it, everywhere it is contrasted with what is not peace and so on. Uh, and, and therefore, it, peace be, the idea of peace becomes a, uh, a self-actualization of our human project. It's something that is what I have called in my last book uh, a, a utopian horizon. You, you and I, human beings, live within a temporal uh, continuum where we, we move from a past into a present, uh, a dynamic present, and that present is always projecting a future, right? This past to the present to the future. And in, in this dynamic present that you and I are living in, in our consciousness, uh, we, we, we judge the past as not being adequate in one way or another. In other words, the past, should I should have done this differently or this should not have happened. These people have should not have been allowed to starve to death or whatever we judge about the past. And at the same time, in this continuum of the present moment, we project into the future. If I'm judging that this should not have happened in the past, so in the future, I, I can project uh, a world in which this does not happen, uh, a world in which I have inner peace, a world in which I'm at peace with my family, a, a world in which nations are at peace with one another and so on. So that's our utopian horizon, as I call it, uh, of our consciousness. And, and another way of talking about that horizon in a general way is to say it's a, it's a vision of peace. So in integral to human awareness is this utopian vision of peace. And utopian here doesn't mean unrealizable. It means that it's inevitably a complement of our capacity to judge what is not right about the world. So Gandhi, for example, I think had uh, such a utopian horizon regarding peace, you know, and uh, he, he, uh, he, interrelated peace and justice and truth, right? Satyagraha means clinging to truth, right? And what is the truth that we're clinging to? Well, it's, uh, it's, a, it's a comprehensive truth. It's a truth that includes all the dimensions of human existence, right? And uh, it's the utopian horizon that, that this truth that we're clinging to needs to become actualized in human affairs the truth of peace, and so on. So, so peace includes all three dimensions that I've been uh, mentioning, the, the dimension of subjectivity. I want peace within the dimension of culture. We want, we want culture of, cultures of peace and our institutions. And I think that third point is, very, is something I want to emphasize uh, uh, as we go on in uh, this presentation. Uh, next slide, please. So, well, I want to look at each of these components uh, uh, briefly, the subjective component, the cultural component, and then the institutional component. Uh, in, in a subjective component, uh, the model of growth, spiritual, moral, cognitive growth has been uh, something that has been articulated by many thinkers uh, over the past several decades. Uh, Lawrence Kohlberg, the psychologist, Carol Gilligan, who wrote a book called In a Different Voice about women's growth, women's development, uh, and uh, Ken Wilber, as I, who I mentioned before. And, and the, the, the basic model that they have put forward is the, is the model that that starts with egocentrism. Young children and you might say immature adults uh, are, are uh, egocentric. They're, they're, they think in terms of my, my, me, me. You think of the current president of the United States, for example, you know, my, my, me, me, everything about him. Uh, and, uh, uh, but, but uh, we're, as we're, in, in a normal developmental process, as we grow, we become socialized, 
as they put it. And we moved from the egocentric to the ethnocentric level in which we absorb the elements of our own culture, our own community, our own religion, uh, our parents' uh, way of doing things and looking at things, our own language and so on. Uh, and, and because we all assimilate these things uh, uh, naturally as we grow, it, it looks to us very often on the ethnocentric level as if our way of thinking, our way of doing things, our, my way uh, that has to do with my language and my culture and my religion and so on, it looks as if this is the most common sense. And so when I look at other people and other cultures and other nations and other using other languages and so on, it looks like they don't have as clear a grasp of reality as, as I do. That's the ethnocentric level. It thinks my way of looking at things is, is the most uh, correct. And, and, uh, <clears throat> my, and people all over the world naturally grow through this level. Uh, the important thing, as these psychologists have pointed out, is that we must keep growing. Right? We must grow beyond this level to the world-centric level, the third level. Right? The world-centric level uh, it can come about through the study of other languages, through travel, through uh, reading books and uh, the internet and so on. You, one begins to realize that uh, my way of looking at the world that I absorbed as a young person is, is not the correct way and not necessarily the most accurate way and so on that the world is a very rich place with uh, wonderful perspectives that come from many traditions and many cultures and one begins to develop the idea that there's there can be such a thing as world citizenship that we can be have a global perspective a planetary perspective uh, and we uh, then transcend our own cultural background, not that we leave it behind or we we uh, think it's less important, but we transcend it because we appreciate uh, our common human civilizational project. We're all the same on this planet, right? As uh, Swami Agnovich and the uh, tradition of the uh, Veda says, uh, uh, Vaishudaiva Kudambakam, right? The world is one family. And this is this is the world centric level, and uh, it's absolutely important that the educational process and the peace leadership process uh, do its best to to point people in the direction of this level of self transcendence. So we're moving from the ethnocentric level to a world centric level. But these these thinkers uh, also point out that there that that's not the final level of development there the the beyond the world centric level is they often think in terms of the cosmocentric level and cosmocentric means that one becomes integrated into uh, a a consciousness of the universe the fundamental principles of the universe Perhaps uh, these uh, and this consciousness can be articulated in terms of different religious traditions, as we know, or different uh, thinkers. I th one Sri Aurobindo comes to mind, right? Uh, uh, Cosm Sri Aurobindo concludes that a human being is the universe become conscious of itself, right? The universe become conscious of itself in us. You know, that's a cosmic. Uh, the uh, cosmic level of uh, cosmocentric level of uh, spiritual development uh, in uh, our, our cultures and our institutions and our education uh, should point in this direction, right? We, we need to think in terms of the model of growth, right? The growth of young people, but also the growth of ourselves. Life is a continual process of development and growth uh, toward these higher levels of awareness. Uh, and uh, so uh, we become grounded at the cosmocentric level 
in in precisely in a, in an ever growing insight into this utopian horizon of peace that I was articulating earlier uh, that uh, 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 that that peace be is is something that is there it it's natural right it's there in the proper development of human beings from egoistic to ethnocentric to uh, world centric to cosmocentric peace it becomes actualized in a more integrated and full uh, greater level so at the uh, we become conscious of to be conscious of our finitude our limitations is simultaneously, as I was saying before, to participate in infinitude, because consciousness itself has this self-transcending quality. And I think this is extremely important to reflect on and realize, because I, I, this is linked in traditions throughout the world. This is linked to the concept of human dignity that uh, there's something, human dignity means there's something special about a human being, any human being, whoever we are, there's something that distinguishes us from the natural world, from mere things. It's there's something that distinguishes us from other living things. Uh, and this uh, has to do with this uh, uh, inner dynamic of consciousness that every human being uh, participates in or shares uh, that, uh, me, you know, that becomes a recognition of something special about it being a human being. And I think this is very important for uh, peace studies to, to uh, reflect on this concept of human dignity. Uh, next, please. Next slide, please. So, so uh, there are certain consequences from, of uh, um, the recognition of human dignity, uh, and I want to try to articulate some of these. Uh, uh, it's there, human dignity, I believe, is there in all the great religious traditions and their scriptures and so on, but it's implicit, largely implicit there. It isn't that they formulate a separate concept of human dignity, uh, but uh, uh, it becomes explicit in the modern world since the Renaissance. Uh, people uh, begin to say uh, that there's something about a human being that needs to be recognized and respected. And that recognition and respect, respect of human dignity is what we mean by human rights, right? Human rights uh, and this is explicit in, in many of the documents that have been developed over the last couple of centuries with regarding human dignity and human rights. Uh, so this, uh, for example, this is there in the UN Universal Declaration. If we could have the next slide, please. And, uh, the UN Universal Declaration of Human Rights uh, which, as we know, is is a list of 30 different rights articulated in 1948, uh, uh, formally uh, recognized on December 10th, which is now Human Rights Day, 1948, uh, led by a group of people from around the world who worked together to to articulate this list of human rights and the preamble. Preamble and Article 1 uh, uh, give exactly what I'm trying to get at here. Preamble says recognition of the inherent dignity and of the equal and inalienable rights of all members of the human family is the foundation of freedom, justice, and peace in the world. Yeah, the recognition of inherent dignity, right? Uh, and out of this um, comes uh, 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 human rights. And then Article 1 repeats that. Right? Article 1 of 30 wants to insist on this idea. So Article 1 says all human beings are born free and equal in dignity and rights. They are endowed with reason and conscience and should act towards one another in the spirit of brotherhood. 
reason and conscience, right? Uh, Immanuel Kant in the 18th century emphasized this as the source of human dignity. Reason and conscience, conscience, Kant said, give us the fundamental imperative of morality, which is to treat every person as an end in themselves and never merely as a means. Right, so if people, Kant said, if people are treated as an end in themselves, that means that they they have dignity, right? To, you can treat things as a means. You can use things. Things, he said, only have price. They do not have dignity. But a human being who has reason and conscience, that is part of the self-transcendence capacity that I was referring to before, human beings who have this, uh, have an intrinsic value, intrinsic worth that must be recognized. Next, next slide, please. So, so uh, the this intrinsic dignity that we have uh, links us. The, the very fact that we're conscious of the world and that we have this self-transcending capacity that I've been talking about before. We move from a past which we judge to be inadequate through a dynamic present toward a utopian horizon that is inevitably projected out of the present uh, capacity for self-transcendence and self ju and judgment. I judge the past to be inadequate. I judge the world to be a place of violence and war and, and disharmony. And, and in, that in that very judgment, I generate a utopian horizon, realizing that it does not have to be like this, right? So we're connected in this way with the whole dynamism of the universe, the dynamism uh, that 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 means that we are in some sense microcosms, right? Microcosms of a of of the fundamental principle of the universe, sometimes called the Tao, the Buddha principle, the Atman, the Holy Spirit, or the image of God. Okay, next slide, please. So so because we have you know this uh, astonishing dimension within us, this astonishing depth within us, which uh, is our capacity for conscious transcendence, uh, the movement of transcendence. Uh, it, uh, we we uh, recognize that we have dignity. And I want to emphasize here that the, that this recognition of dignity is fundamental for developing uh, the various aspects of peace. And, and I want to uh, just uh, uh, articulate these four, which I think are fairly fundamental. Others, we could, we could identify others to, as well, but, but the first uh, uh, consequence of recognizing this amazing thing that each of us is, which is a human being, the first consequence of recognizing it is is the recognition of human rights, right? And that is explicit in documents like the UN Universal Declaration of Human Rights that we just looked at. Uh, the second uh, is that we we develop ever more greater capacity for compassion and kindness. Right? If we recognize in others the same dignity that we have in ourselves. We recognize this, this amazing capacity that we have in ourselves, this dynamism of self-transcendence and reason and conscience, as Kant puts it. Then, then the, the recognition of that in others, uh, uh, because it's a species phenomena. You know, Karl Marx said that the, the, the most important thing that we can be concern with is thinking in terms of our species being. That's what he called it, our species being. Uh, uh, that we are all human. We're all the same. That's a uh, part of moving to the world cent centric level of consciousness in the in the model of development of moral and cognitive development. 
we become world centric and this world centric uh, uh, level can recognize a universal dignity and universal human rights and therefore its capa capacity for compassion and kindness is 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 continually magnified where we continually develop ever greater capacity for compassion and kindness and the third consequence that comes from a recognition of dignity is nonviolence right of course gandhi uh, uh, is the the most famous perhaps the father of this idea uh, uh, he recognized the atman in people Right, the Atman that that we are all manifestations of the divine, uh, and uh, in doing this, he insisted that it would be impossible to use violence against another person, precisely because that person shared with us the this this sacred dignity, the sacred capacity. But but it's not necessary to limit uh, to use any one set of ideas in the recognition of dignity because they can be articulated this can be articulated in many ways right humanists for example atheists people who don't want to talk about the atman they they have very often in history they have recognized human dignity this special uh, 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 feature of human beings that has to be the foundation of our Peace work and our foundation of our uh, understanding of ourselves on planet Earth. So this dignity results in nonviolence. If people really have dignity, if they really are ends in themselves, how could we organize in terms of military, for example, military of this country or that country, which is willing in order to defend whatever principles they're willing to kill they're willing to bomb they're willing to destroy the life support systems of people in other countries well there's something problematic here if everybody has this intrinsic dignity what right do they have to do that not a it's very problematic Right. And then the fourth uh, consequence of dignity that I want to emphasize here is the capacity for dialogue directed toward mutual understanding. Right. Dialogue is fundamental to establishing, creating, promoting peace. And uh, the most famous uh, promoter of this was perhaps Jürgen Habermas, the, the great German thinker, uh, who, who in his study of language and the human capacity for language, uh, f discerned that the capacity for dialogue directed toward mutual understanding is more fundamental, it's primordial, it's what makes language possible, he said, uh, and the secondary dimensions of language, when we use language as an instrumentally, instrumentally means we, we treat uh, the object of our speaking as an instrument that we can manipulate, or we use our language strategically, right? Nation states will negotiate with one another strategically to try to get the best deal or business business uh, negotiations will be strategic and so on. Those those levels of language, Habermas said, are parasitic upon the most fundamental feature of language, which is its capacity for real communication, real mutual understanding. Not, not language used to manipulate you, to get you to go along or with me or whatever, but language in which we really come to some sort of a communion, some sort of a, a mutual uh, recognition that's, that's more fundamental than anything strategic. Uh, and the recognition of dignity of, of people, I think is also foundational for this. If I, if I really uh, 
understand that other people have this intrinsic dignity, the same dignity as myself, then my use of language can be to to really try to understand the world from their point of view, to really try to listen, to really try to communicate as honestly and as openly as possible in order for a community of understanding to develop. Right? And if we're going to have peace in this world, we've, we've got to have uh, dialogue directed toward mutual understanding because the the language of the world, the languages, the talk of the world is just is, is anything but that right now, right? It's uh, it's uh, uh, Facebook and uh, the the social media and so on uh, are are places where anything except mutual understanding is cultivated, right? Fear and hate and misinformation and, and uh, uh, violence and so on. All of that is uh, our consequences of language, the use of language right now on a worldwide scale. Okay, next, next please. So, so the, the first level that we've been talking about is the subjective level. The, the level that, which is most fundamental because w w human beings wouldn't be able to talk about culture. We wouldn't be able to talk about institutions if it weren't for this amazing capacity for co self-consciousness that we have and self-transcendence. It's what gives us our dignity, our special uh, characteristic as human beings, as microcosms of the macrocosm. Uh, so on the cultural level, uh, 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 I want to emphasize that all three of these uh, dimensions are interact with one another, and and I'll continue to emphasize that as we go on. But the but cultural level mirrors the subjective level, right? A culture of peace and education uh, will recognize human dignity and its consequences. So, in terms of people talk about promoting a culture of peace, right? Well, a culture of peace will promote human rights, right? A culture of peace will promote compassion and kindness. A culture of peace will promote nonviolence. And also it will promote a dialogue directed toward mutual understanding, right? So the subjective uh, self-transcendent capacity that human beings have Right, leading to our our understanding of our dignity, our intrinsic human dignity. Uh, that the consequences of that are these four dimensions, and the consequences of culture of peace are also these four dimensions. Uh, now, one thing I want to mention there uh, is that uh, peace activists and peace educators, especially around the world, uh, talk very often, as we're all aware, about a culture of peace and promoting a culture of peace. And they and we all write articles and we all uh, uh, um, put out uh, products, uh, intellectual products connected with a culture of peace. But there's a I think there's a certain danger in this because what it leaves out is the institutional transformative level. Right. Uh, and this is what I'm going to be saying in just a moment that, that we need all three of these dimensions, the subjective, the cultural and the institutional. And and it's not going to be sufficient as peace leaders and educators to simply limit our 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 efforts to promoting a culture of peace. Yeah, but I think this is done all over the world and I think that's not adequate. It's, it's a mistake. Okay, next please. Uh, and one of the things, one of the um, dialogues that took place or the uh, disagreements that took place, especially during the Cold War, but it's still going on today in various ways. Uh, um, in, in During the Cold War, uh, there was a great division in the world, as many of you remember, between the Western idea of uh, 
of human rights and the so-called Eastern or communist idea in the Soviet Union and communist China of human rights. And uh, the West said, uh, um, you know, human rights have to do with uh, political freedom and speech and freedom of religion and so on. Uh, and uh, they're, all of them are coming out of the UN Universal Declaration of Human Rights and so on. But the, the communists said, well, no, you in the West, you don't res respect human rights because you allow massive poverty, you allow misery in people and so on. But we in the East, we respect human rights, they said, uh, because uh, we give people uh, food, clothing and shelter and uh, social security and we guarantee them a job and so on. Uh, and, and the point that I want to make here is that uh, is that human rights are not cultural, right? They're, of course, they're mediated culturally, right? We talk, we have emphases in different traditions, different cultural traditions, but if human rights arise from human dignity, human dignity is not something that is cultural. It's mediated culturally, sure. In different religions, the human dignity might be articulated in different ways and so on. But but human dignity has to do, as I've been uh, saying in this presentation, with something about uh, human consciousness, human self-consciousness. Each of us, this dynamism of uh, a present moment, integrating its past into a uh, uh, a, a present that projects for itself a utopian future, a utopian horizon that is different from the past and so on. Uh, this human dignity is universal. And so cultural debates over human rights are misguided in that sense that uh, that uh, we we need both. Right. We need both uh, the so-called communist idea or socialist idea of human rights. Uh, the philosopher Alan Gay Worth wrote a number of books about this, very, very powerful books uh, in in which he distinguishes between freedom and well-being. Uh, the well-being rights, right, social security, uh, adequate remuneration for our work, uh, um, uh, uh, free education, health care, and so on. The well-being rights are just as fundamental as the freedom rights. Freedom of speech, freedom of religion, freedom of uh, of assembly, freedom of protest, and so on. And he he made, Alan Gayworth made a powerful argument that, that uh, government is if government represents the people, government is supposed to represent the common good, that it is responsible for both those dimensions, right? There's two kinds of rights, but the, they're integrated together uh, under the heading of freedom and well-being. And if you're familiar with the UN Universal Declaration, uh, it, it, it does include both dimensions of rights, right? Article 25 of the UN Universal Declaration says everyone has a right to a standard of living adequate for himself and his family, right? Everyone has a right to social security and protection in case of illness or old age and so on. Uh, so I, I want to emphasize this, that, that it's not a cultural issue here, that there, we're looking at something more primordial, our common humanity. Right, which is what human dignity points toward. Okay, next, next slide, please. Uh, at the institutional level, right, there's three levels: the subjective level, the cultural level, the institutional level. Right, we need to go beyond cultural activism. We need institutional transformation. All right, uh, this this uh, this image here on this slide is from Ellen Hodgins Brown. It's a cover of Ellen Hodgins Brown, The Web of Debt. Uh, um, and uh, I, I know her. Uh, uh, and, uh, you know, uh, have taught her her book, The Web of Debt, in, in which articulates the 
the global world of banking and the way the global world of banking enslaves the people of work, the nations, the poor nations of the world and and the uh, uh, people of the world and keeps them in perpetual debt and, and keeps those people who hold the reins of uh, these conditions in a perpetual realm of tremendous wealth and tremendous power. Uh, so we have a, a world of global capitalism. These are the two institutions that dominate our world, global capitalism and militarized sovereign nation states. Right? And both of these are institutional embodiments that defeat peace. This is what I want to emphasize here. They defeat peace. Global, um, ne next slide, please. So here we have on the left a uh, model of our world, right, divided into uh, some nearly 200 sovereign nation states with absolute borders, most of those borders militarized, most of those nations militarized. Together, they all, they're now spending about 1.8 trillion US dollars per year on militarism and wars. If we want a culture of peace, uh, t you know, terrorism is a horrible thing and we, we all need to find ways to end terrorism, certainly. But terrorism is just a drop in the bucket compared to these nations, right? These nations spending $1.8 trillion a year on war and militarism and preparation for war and nuclear weapons and the rest of it, right? That's the real horror of our planet. It's not terrorism, right? Because these nations are themselves terrorists, right? To be under the threat of total planetary destruction since the 1950s, which the Cold War put us in, right? Russia with its nuclear weapons and intercontinental delivery systems, US with its nuclear weapons, the rest of the nations eventually with all with many of them with nuclear weapons. This this is terrorism. This is this is just unacceptable. It's a world that is structured exactly the opposite of the way we need to structure our planet. So so on the right here on this slide, right, we have a picture that has only been available to us since the early 1960s, about 1962, these first photographs from the spaceships began to be transmitted back to the Earth, right? And we see that here we are, you know, this planet has no, this picture, there's no borders, there's no militarized borders, there's no divisions, it's one tiny little spaceship, tiny little uh, uh, sphere floating in space with one dominant species, the human species everywhere on it. This is, I want to, uh, I want to uh, emphasize that this is the reality of our situation, right? There's the, the, this, this picture on the left is a distortion. It's a distortion coming from uh, 100, 350 years ago, all right, they say that this this system of sovereign nation states was first articulated at the Peace of Westphalia in 1648. 1648, 350 years ago, and we're still operating with this. You know, think how naive they were in 1648. Many people didn't even believe the world was round. They didn't even believe we were. You know, they had no idea that we we're on a planet circling the sun, and here we are. Uh, 350 years later, we've got our world divided up with absolute borders, with militaries at each of these borders, right? It's time we converted to the right-hand model, right? It's time we became liberated. We're one planet, one people, one human race. Okay, next slide, please. The same kind of 
thing operates with capitalism, right? Capitalism was born in the Renaissance, they say, in the Italian Renaissance, and has developed over the last hundreds and hundreds of years, and now it, it dominates the globe. Multinational corporations everywhere, huge banking uh, consortiums everywhere operate with the money and uh, the uh, uh, monetary policies of nations and so on. Uh, and uh, the result, you can see on the right here in this chart, uh, the result as of 2017, it's even worse today in 2020, uh, the top 1% owns 50% of all the wealth in the world. It's just a, it's just an obscenity, right? If we're all human beings, if we all have dignity, if we all have this utopian horizon of a transformed world that is there in our very human, built into our human consciousness, then this is an obscenity, right? And the next 4%, right? If you add the top 5%, they own 75% of all the wealth in the world or more. And then you can see on this chart, the bottom 50% of humanity, they own 0.6% of the wealth. They live in hell. Where is their dignity? Where is their human rights? It's, it's simply, it's a system that does not respect their human rights. Right? And that's what I want to emphasize here, that neither the nation state system nor the capitalist system are predicated as institutions on human rights, right? You can see it in the, uh, you can see what I'm trying to get at in the little cartoon on the left here. Uh, the, the woman this, uh, who in the cartoon with her children and he, she says mine, right? And she's referring to my children, my family, my life. Uh, and something entirely different than what the capitalists on the other side of the cartoon is saying, mine, right? Mine is money, right? Mine is capital. And, and so there's a whole uh, disparity because the human rights and the human dignity are there in the woman and her children. And this accumulation of capital, which gives people power over others, Right? The rich have extraordinary power to influence the political process, to create institutions to, to benefit themselves and the world, to dominate things, to create uh, industrial military complexes which generate bombs and war. The rich have this power because they're operating with something that has nothing to do with human dignity. Right? It's accumulations of capital. And it's the same with the nation states, right? A nation state defined by absolute borders, recognizing no power over itself, right? That's what it means to be sovereign. A sovereign nation state, uh, the sovereign means ultimate. The ultimate authority lies with the nation. So if the United States is a sovereign nation, there's no authority over it that can tell it what to do. And that's why, as we all probably know, international law is not really law because when the UN system formulates a treaty of some sort uh, and all these nations agree to the treaty, it's just voluntary. There's no authority uh, in the United Nations that can enforce the treaties that it makes with other, because it's a collection of sovereign nations. Right, so we have these institutions that have nothing to do with human dignity that dominate our world. No wonder our world is this horrible place of violence and, and misery, human misery and violence and disruption. Next, please. So the UN system right, is predicated precisely on these two institutions, right? The UN system developed in 1945 after the Second World War. The five winners in that war, Russia, China, the UK, France, and Britain, they instituted, the, they created the United Nations system and put themselves on the Security Council permanently with a veto 
every one of them having a veto over everything the United Nations can possibly do, right? It's a system of domination of those five. And uh, it's, it's, it's not a democracy, the General Assembly, uh, even if they vote uh, unanimously for some proposition, it will go to the Security Council and be vetoed by one of those five. The, the system is unworkable. And so since that time, right, uh, there have been some 150 wars, right? The uh, preamble to the UN system says, says uh, uh, we, this is about just establishing peace because twice in our lifetime, there's been untold sorrow brought to humanity by these wars. So we want to end wars. It's a lie, right? You can't end war with a system of power, absolute territorial sovereign nations dividing the world into these nations, each of which does not recognize any binding authority over itself, each of, its w of which has the right to militarize all at once. It's a war system. Right. And billions of people remain in poverty today, in spite of the UN claim that it's trying to uh, create a better world. Endless human rights violations all over the world, everywhere. Immense environmental destruction, right? Uh, that uh, the UN has become aware of since 19, since its first conference on the environment in 1972. So the UN system is structurally unable to achieve peace, justice. It might have, a, there are certainly are a lot of caring and good people working within the UN, right? There's a lot of, the, the, but that's not sufficient because it's the structural element, the institutional element that is a fundamental key to peace. And that's what I want to emphasize in this, uh, to, in this talk, right? That, that structurally, we need a peace system for the world. Uh, next slide, please. So there's a uh, dynamic reci reciprocity if we're going to be concerned with peace, right? Our consciousness resulting in awareness of our dignity and the four consequences of that that we talked about. Culture has to be transformed, but institutions. And institutions influence culture. Right, uh, we've been uh, having a, uh, a conference here in the uh, uh, um, United States of on uh, uh, building a new world. And we've had lots of speakers who are talking about a new economy, a great new economy, how a cooperative economy. And we've had speakers talking about uh, uh, developing uh, uh, cultures that that satisfy the human need for transcendence and inspiration and solidarity and relationship with others and so on. Uh, but but the, these the, these visions, right, of how things could and should be different will not and cannot be actualized unless we also change those institutions that defeat, that defeat peace. And these institutions are the institution of global capitalism and the institution of militarized sovereign nation states. Those structurally defeat peace. So if we want peace, we need to be thinking in a holistic vision that includes all these three dimensions. Next, next slide, please. So the, that's why I have spent my life uh, since 1995 uh, promoting and emphasizing and studying the Constitution for the Federation of Earth. Uh, I did not write it. Uh, I wrote the introduction to this version of it, but uh, as I described earlier, it was written by hundreds of world citizens working together for 23 years at the end of the 20th century. Right, but uh, but the it, what we need, if we're going to have peace on this planet, is not just you know in personal growth and not just cultural transformation. We need a peace system, a, a world peace, institutionalized peace system. 
And that means we've got to put global democracy, democracy, real democracy, representing the people, the common good of the people of Earth. We've got to put them in charge over the nations. We don't get rid of the nations, but we put the people of Earth in charge above the nations so that they can create enforceable world law that the nations and their leaders must obey, right? And we put the people of Earth in power above the corporations so that they, again, not necessarily abolishing corporations or the, the giant uh, capitalist banking cartels, but putting an authority in power over them to insist that they operate according to the common good of the people of Earth. Right. That's what's missing in today's world. There's no authority, democratic authority, representing the common good of the people of Earth over the non-dignity-based sovereign nation states and, and global uh, capitalist corporations. Next, next, please. Next slide, please. So the uh, the very first article of the Earth Constitution says that uh, the purpose of this, right? The purpose of this is not to eliminate nations. Nations and their cultures and their traditions are all wonder. Are many of them are wonderful and and uh, but we we need but they cannot be the ultimate political entity because the, it it becomes a power system, a world of powerful and less powerful nations, all militarized, all uh, against one another and so on. That's not a peace system, that's a war system. And uh, so the functions of the democratic world government are the functions that are beyond the capacity, beyond the scope of nations. No nation, uh, the, look at number one here, please. Uh, prevent war and secure disarmament. See, no nation on earth, no matter how wonderful its vision might be, can do this because it is not in charge of all the other nations, right? Uh, the other nations will not, you know, the, the India might say, oh, we need to disarm. And then people will say, but what about Pakistan? What about China? And so on. And so the system itself prevents it from changing prevents it from moving toward peace. So so we need uh, above the nations, there are global issues that the nations themselves cannot handle. The second one, protect human rights worldwide. Again, uh, nations can't, you know, no matter how concerned some nation is with human rights, it can't protect them in Myanmar. It can't protect them in Indonesia and so on. You need, we need a global authority to do this. Third, create the conditions for universal prosperity, right? To get rid of poverty on the planet. There's no nation that can do this. Fourth, regulate and protect world resources, right? Which are fast becoming destroyed by the, the operations of the nations and the uh, capitalist corporations of the world. We need someone to protect the earth and for future generations protect the environment and the ecological fabric of all life. And to devise, and this is a key thing, and, and number six here, devise solutions for all problems that are beyond the scope of national governments and plan for the future, right? National governments, even if they meet in the UN or someplace, as long as they're meeting as sovereign nations, there's no way that they can unite to solve these problems because they, each one, they don't trust each other. They, they see each other as enemies, US and Russia and so on, China and India. Uh, we need a democratic authority over all, which is the fundamental idea of peace. Okay, next slide, please. So what I want to do is just uh, conclude uh, my my presentation here by by emphasizing that the constitution which is based on universal human dignity right it it doesn't mention that very often in the course of the constitution but you you read it and you say well this is about 
all human beings, right? This is about the common good of all human beings. This is about the the need of all human beings for food, clothing, and shelter, and freedom, uh, and so on. That's the human dignity. It's based on these. It's based on human dignity, and so it, it has the same four consequences that I uh, mentioned in terms of human dignity on the subjective level, human dignity on the cultural level, right? It, human right, it has the consequence of human rights protection, cultivation of compassion and kindness, nonviolence, and dialogue directed toward mutual understanding. Next slide, please. So Article 28, people have pointed out that there's something very interesting in Article 28 of the UN Universal Declaration of Human Rights. It says that everyone is entitled to a social and international order in which the rights and freedoms set forth in this declaration can be fully realized. You know, maybe they understood back in 1948 when they wrote this that this document that the, the the social order that had been institutionalized in 1945 as the United Nations was inadequate. And it is inadequate. It's never been able to actualize the rights of uh, the human beings. It hasn't been able to protect human rights. It hasn't been able to stop war. It hasn't been able to end poverty. Right. So so uh, we we, you know, we're we don't want to abolish the UN. We want to replace its charter, its inadequate charter with a real constitution and take all these agencies, the World Health Organization, the World Human Rights Organization, all these excellent agencies and integrate them into a real constitution for the earth. Right. That's what's necessary. Next next slide, please. So human rights in the Earth Constitution, right? Uh, it it it, uh, it gives both these kinds of human rights that I was discussing before: the rights to freedom and the rights to well-being. Right? People people who are living in poverty, and misery, and desperate for where their next meal is coming from, which is about fifty percent of the people on Earth, right? People who live in that condition uh, cannot be expected to be exercising their rights to freedom and thought and, and freedom of religion and so on. They don't care about those things. If human rights are to be respected, they have to be our well-being rights every, and as well as our political rights. But there, the Constitution institutes what is sometimes called a third generation of human rights. Right. There's the original uh, first generation was political rights. The second generation well-being rights. The third generation are planetary rights, the right to peace. And the right to a protected planetary environment. Right. These are not included in the UN Universal Declaration. The right to peace and a right to a protected planetary environment. Right. So so the the Earth Constitution results in real human rights protection for the first time. Next slide, please. So the Earth Constitution also results in the cultivation of compassion and kindness. And of course, here's a picture of our famous, wonderful uh, Dalai Lama, who is a spokesperson for love, compassion, and tolerance, which he says are necessities, not luxuries, right? But but if these are necessities and not luxuries, we need institutional transformation that can make it possible for people to have love, compassion, and tolerance, right? We need a world system. We, uh, as long as we're, we're uh, militarized nation states and we see enemies in other countries and so on, it's not going to happen. We're not going to love the Russians. We're not going to love the those who uh, seem to be opposed to us on the level of sovereign nation states. 
right? So the preamble of the world of the Earth Constitution talks about the foundation of peace being unity in diversity, right? But it's this genuine legal and economic unity of the human family under the Earth Constitution that allows us once we 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 are politically and economically a family. We have every child born grows up and says, I'm a citizen of the earth. I'm also a citizen of India or China or whatever, but I'm I'm a citizen of the earth. And I have rights as a citizen of the earth and duties to the rest of humanity as citizen of the earth. Then compassion and kindness will begin to spread around the world. Right? And not until then. Otherwise, we're we're working uphill against the battle, uphill against capitalism. We're working uphill against a sovereign nation state. It's not going to happen unless we have a world system that makes it possible. Ne next slide, please. Nonviolence. Right now, the the Earth Constitution abolishes war and military. Right? But it does not abolish police. There's police for enforcing world law are civilian police. And there it says they can be armed with weapons necessary to apprehend individuals, not military weapons, right? Because military is going to be gone. But weapons, but but it also says that that uh, as this constitution is institutionalized and society is transformed, that the world police will be mandated to uh, decrease the lethal capacity of their weapons. They will more and more uh, um, uh, convert to weapons which are uh, non-lethal. If they have to arrest someone who has violated the law or is, who is a rogue agent or whatever, they can do this with with um, body nets. You know, there's all kinds of ways to capture people without shooting them, without killing them and so on. And, and it actually says that this is what they must be doing. Now, notice what it, it also says in Article 10, describing the, the enforcement procedures of the world police. Uh, it, this is a quote, a basic condition preventing outbreaks of violence which the enforcement system shall facilitate in every way possible, shall be to assure a fair hearing under nonviolent circumstances for any person or group having a grievance, and likewise to assure a fair opportunity for a just settlement of any grievance with due regard for the rights and welfare of all concerned. Right. This is a, a model of a nonviolent world system, right? Anywhere, any person, any group, anywhere, a basic condition for preventing violence is really to listen to people, really to give them a fair hearing, really to have a circumstance, a circumstance, a nonviolent circumstances in which they can express themselves, communicate themselves, and and know that there's the concern for a fair and just concern for their grievance, right? Nonviolent, progressively greater nonviolence gets built right into it. Okay, and then last, next slide, please. Uh, last, but again, not least, uh, dialogue, the, the fourth consequence of, uh, of recognizing human dignity and the fourth consequence of a culture of peace is also a consequence of uh, uh, of the democratic world law under the Earth Constitution, and that is now people will be able to dialogue with one another. No longer strategic language between nations, diplomacy, and so on. That's not what it's all about, right? What we need to do as human beings is find an institutional and cultural and subjective uh, world environment in which we're really able to dialogue and come to mutual understanding. So the very passage that I just read to you from Article 10 of the Constitution also facilitates dialogue. People who can meet under the equality of, of uh, conditions of equality and dignity. Right? Discourse is no longer a strategic maneuvering as it is in the UN and, and so on. Uh, 
uh, it's 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 uh, the, we have the capacity to really talk. And so real dialogue, right? The world parliament will have people from a thousand electoral districts around the world. It'll have a house of counselors, 200 wise people from around the world. It'll have a house of nations, people from every nation there in the world parliament. And the conditions are set for them really to be able to talk with one another and come to a mutual understanding because they're there on behalf of the common good of humanity and its future. OK, so I think that's the last slide. Um, yeah, next slide, please. So so in conclusion, I, I, I want to uh, point you. Uh, there's the, the website, the new website uh, for www.earthconstitution.world. Uh, the WCPA has joined together with the Earth Constitution Institute. Uh, and I, I want to um, urge you to reflect on the idea that the Earth Constitution is, is, can serve as a gold standard for peace leadership and education, right? That, that, that peace leadership and peace uh, education is, is not adequate uh, uh, just on the subjective level or just on the cultural level. We also need to have a vision of institutionalized peace on the planetary level. And that, in my mind, that's the, the role of the Constitution for the Federation of Earth. So thank you very much for your attention. Uh, if I don't know, do we have uh, time for questions or how do, how do we proceed from here? Thank you, everybody, very much. Sure, sure. Uh, uh, thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Uh, Thank you, Dr. Martin, for your um, uh, thought-provoking address. Uh, it's always a fascination, uh, fascinating experience for us to listen to you, your words. Uh, I now hand it over to Dr. Tyagi for uh, uh, question-answer session and uh, further. Thank you. Over to Dr. Tyagi. Thank you.